so I'm going to talk by joint work with Matthias and Ben. So, you know, if you have more specific questions to ask, direct them, uh, direct your questions to them. Um, so for me, it was more learning than actually doing research. I was chugging along. So, and I'm going to try to tell you what I understood of what they were doing. This, this is published in a special issue on molecular dynamics in entropy. So if you want to have, uh, you know, it's open access, have a look if you're curious. So the key word here is position dependent. So let's look at the equation we want to say things about. So we have this uh, uh, structure, this is a second order equation. And for the momentum part, we have three different terms. So there's a lot of jargon. So this is called the force. This is called the uh, friction or dissipation term, or you know, it's also called the drag sometimes. And this is called the noise, the random force, um, the temperature sometimes, or even you know, some other terms. Um, so we have uh, Q refers to positions in space, and, uh, and so P, so confusingly, P is not for position, but for momenta. And we have, so we can think of a bunch of particles that all share a d-dimensional space, like uh, the plane, and they are running along. And they may interact in many ways, so by the force, by the friction, or even by the noise. Uh, there's a mass matrix that relates uh, the, the, the essentially the response of position to momenta, which we're going to forget about. We just set it to one. Um, and uh, this is about what I wanted to say. So this is, this is the equation we want to study, right? Yes? Yeah, they're position dependent, sorry. I got confused myself. <laughs> so the, actually, so, it's, it's, so there's, I think there should be space for studying the velocity dependent ones, not the position dependent ones. But, uh, and I think it's been done in the literature somewhat, but that's not what we're doing here. Sorry, just one other question. Yes? Do you have the length of conservation here? No, there is uh, no, no conservation. And uh, even the force may not be conservative all by themselves. So it's, um, it's one of the extensions of, the, of this work. Uh, and I show an example. So actually, we're, we're going to have uh, three different examples. One which is going to play with a non-standard force, a non-conservative one. One which is going to play with a non-constant friction. And what, one which is going to play with non-constant temperature. So temperature gradient or non-constant noise, position-dependent noise. And you don't assume detailed balance condition between gamma and friction? No, so that's. I think that's kind of the point, which means, you know, so by uh, squeezing out existing proof techniques due to Jonathan in particular, we, we, we got rid of this fluctuation dissipation thing. And we find that if you, so the goal here is to show that there's a unique, uh, I mean, under suitable sufficient conditions, that among other things, that there's a unique invariant uh, probability distribution that the entire system converges quickly to. That, that's the goal. And to get there, you don't need to assume uh, reversibility or this kind of commonly assumed things. Uh, I about finished the talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so the, uh, this is a particular case where the friction is constant, and so is the temperature. So beta here is the inverse temperature, as usual. And in that case, we know lots of things. Uh, we know there's a unique invariant distributions. That, uh, that decouples the position and momenta. And this is given by the total energy of the system, which is a joint contribution of the kinetic uh, term and the potential U. And as the uh, temperature goes to zero, this uh, expectedly, uh, the distribution becomes a lot more uh, concentrated. So one of the things we lose when we go to position-dependent terms is that we don't really have an explicit form for the invariant measure. So that makes things a bit more complicated. And concretely, I understand it also makes things more complicated because when you run numerical simulations, uh, you like to know the answer. So if you have an explicit form, it's much easier to convince yourself that your numerical simulations are doing the right thing or about the right thing. So, uh, so we don't know the form but we still want to prove that there is one and uh, that it's unique and to say something about how quickly we converge there. So we are looking for geometric ergodicity. 
or exponential uh, convergence rate. So what are the results? So, uh, so I, I give a detailed statement for the theorem, but uh, this is the summary. So the, the statement is the following. There are sufficient, natural sufficient conditions on all the terms we've looked at. So for the friction, we need this to be positive definite, which means that, uh, which is kind of intuitive, right? It means that uh, in every possible direction, you have a little bit of slowing down. So there's friction in every direction. We need the noise to be full rank, which is kind of expected as well, because if we, you lose stochasticity in one direction, then maybe you, you get trapped. Uh, we need it to be uniformly bounded, so that's also kind of natural, right? Like if you have insane noises uh, as you go away in your space, then good things are not going to happen. And, uh, and we need some kind of control and force, which is related to the Harris convergence condition. Uh, I'll come back to this. And then under those sufficient conditions, we derive geometric convergence of uh, a certain class of observables. And the proof follows the paper by Jonathan Stuart and uh, Des. How do you pronounce his uh, family name? Hi, am. Okay, so I'm, I'm glad I didn't try. <laughs> so essentially, they treat the constant case, whereas nothing is position dependent. But actually, the proof techniques that they use kind of imply the results I'm going to present here. So it's kind of a, 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 it's the same proof pipeline. And, and so it's kind of a just careful rereading of uh, this proof. And there's a further paper also by Jonathan and Martin Hyra, uh, a little later, which is reformulating the Harris condition, which is the uh, operational thing behind the proof, in terms of contractivity of a kind of a bizarre metric, as a, some kind of weighted total variation metric. And so in the end, this is some kind of contractivity-based argument for geometric convergence, which is kind of uh, satisfying. Um, all right. So, so I want to say something about other Langevin dynamics. So we said the velocity-dependent coefficients would be interesting, and they've been studied somewhat, uh, but not by us. There is a generalized Langevin equation, and there's a recent paper by Matthias and Ben on this. So these are non-Markovian Langevin dynamics, which are on your way to, from micro to macro, you stumble onto this, this kind of little things with a kernel. So your, your terms depend a little bit on the past with exponentially decaying coefficients. So th this is new stuff. So again, ask Ben and Matthias. Um, and uh, then we have also dissipative particle dynamics, which is almost a particle case of what we're doing here, uh, but not exactly, and uh, ask Ben or Matthias. Um, because of the non-degeneracy conditions, they have some total momentum conservation principle, which uh, kind of, uh, on the face of it, escapes the methods we are following here, but not, not really, actually. Is that, is that a good thing to say? So these are the other, you know, other ways in which you would like to extend Langevin dynamics. I forgot to say, but this is maybe completely understood by everyone here, that Langevin dynamics as modeling tools, I forgot to say I'm a computer scientist first, and so and also interested in stochastic modeling. And as a modeling tool, these are they are very common and, and you know quite powerful tools. So this is this is my interest into this game. Okay, so there's also an entire segment of uh, the, the work which is about correctly doing the, uh, you know, good and efficient numerical integration. So let me say a few words about this, although this is really out of my uh, uh, subject of expertise. So the idea is that you split your stochastic vector field uh, carefully into little uh, additive terms. And when you combine them well, you can have uh, very efficient methods. You can integrate uh, the, the actual time steps, you can do exact, uh, uh, for, e for each of your contributions, you can do exact integration. And there are many choices, and Ben has published uh, extensively about this. But here, uh, it, it turns out that that's not exactly what we're doing when we do the simulations, but we're using uh, multiple time stepping methods, of which I know nothing. But uh, that, so it turns out that the clever, um, exact integration methods are too expensive uh, when the 
terms are too much depending on the position. So classically, they are really good. In that case, it's, a better, it's better to do multiple time stepping. And again, and I said that already, uh, there's a, since we don't know what the answer looks like, we have to be very careful that we're doing good numerical integration. There are subtle issues here. All right, so let's not uh, talk about this anymore. So I'm going to present the main result, just state it, actually. So it's a bit of a, I mean, it's kind of a heavy theorem, lots of assumptions, if you're not used to it, so let's go slowly. So let's look at what we say about friction and the friction and the noise terms, respectively. So I put uh, back again the, uh, the main equation we're dealing with. So the first condition says that uh, friction should be uniformly bounded above and below away from zero. So uh, if we have infinite friction or something that tends to infinity somewhere in space, it doesn't look very good, right? So of course, th this, this kind of uh, global control is only meaningful when your uh, set of position is of the form R to the N, right? If you're working on some kind of bounded uh, configuration space, you, these are trivial things, you don't have to ask them. And so, so you know, this means uh, infinite friction intuitively is not very good. You could get trapped somewhere. And uh, if you have zero friction, then uh, you may uh, actually be too fast, I guess. Uh, so like we said, the diffusion matrix, so the noise part is full rank. And we also going to assume that the, uh, you know, noise doesn't go uh, unboundedly uh, on your position space. So that's, that was not too uh, complicated. So now let's look at the assumptions on four. So these are much more technical. So the first one is just that your potential has to be bounded away from minus infinity on your full uh, position domain. Then the two of so this is, this is that uh, your force may not be actually coming from a potential, but it's actually dominated in that sense by an existing potential, a Lyapunov function. So um, by the gradient of such, sorry. And then that gradient itself is dominated by a control like this, and this is related. So the way I understand this is this is what you need to prove the uh, um, inequality on the uh, generator of your Langevin dynamics to apply the uh, Aris condition. So this is related to uh, the um, contractivity of the uh, of the generator or the embedded Markov chain. Uh, so if you simplify all the assumptions and you get rid of the position dependency, you find exactly the conditions in the reference paper from Jonathan. Yeah, so to write this, uh, to, to understand why this is coming from, you have to know how to write the infinitesimal generator of the Langevin dynamics and then the Harris condition. Very likely, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, I. Yeah. Integrate the gross condition. It's like your position. No, no, but it's just the practical thing. You need one other condition. Yeah, so I can convert it. It's interesting. Be, so, um, so um, I, I see why you're asking this. I think so. I'm not uh, competent to answer uh, right away, but. Um, but there's no reason in principle that the uh, stationary measure is going to imply that this partition function is finite. Yeah, but you see, even in the case where your very first example, the U is not normalizable, the Gibbs measure is not a stationary distribution, it's an overload. That's right. But that's exactly the what we're talking about, I think. Yeah. It's interesting, actually. Yeah, so, so let me rephrase, so it's, it's interesting. So you, would, you can always write a pseudo distribution, the e to, e to the minus beta u, right? 
Now, the, so we said, and we're going to show examples where we see that the actual invariant probability distribution is not of that form, right? So there's no contradiction between this thing not being normalizable, which is kind of the signature of a Brownian motion or something, and the fact that we prove the unicity of the stationary yeah, yeah, motion. Just talk about your second slide, which is not always correct, I believe. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. This is not always correct. There are, there are some conditions here. Yeah, yeah. This is this is a, is that. Yeah, no. yeah, exactly. So this is a non-position dependent, position dependent. Even that very, very simple absolutely, absolutely. I take your point. So, but uh, the conditions that we are piling up after are getting rid of this nasty, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. For example, uh, if uh, gamma is zero and you, there's no potential at all, then you don't have a, a stationary distribution. Right. Um, but so I'm just intrigued. If well, many, many biologists, just set up, many biologists just set up a model. Yeah. That's right. No, but, but uh, you the physicists of the 21st century would say, no, we don't need this set. Uh, or they would say, this is because we're looking at just part of the system. At, yeah, uh, just checking all that. I mean, right, right. There are right. Lots of cases where that could happen. Yeah. 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 So in a way, this is a way to, I mean, so to me, this is a way to stop thinking like the physicists and to just push symbols and see what we can prove. You know, I've talked to many physicists over the last decade. That's a little painful sometimes. <laughs> All right. So, um, okay. So, sorry. So, have we are we done yet with the yeah, the assumptions? Then we're going to suppose that everything. So, all the free terms are smooth over the domain, and so here are the conclusions. So, we do have unique invariant probability. It has a smooth density. Uh, then we have this uh, statement of convergence, which I'm going to so it's read with you. So let's say uh, we pick a number bigger than one, uh, and then we pick an observable in that particular banner weighted banner space. So we have yet to describe it; uh, it's coming. And then what we have is that the mean value of phi, dependent on where you start from at time t, is going to converge exponentially quickly with some rate which we don't have an explicit uh, uh, expression for, uh, to, uh, what, uh, to, to the actual uh, static average, uh, as you were saying, with respect to mu, the invariant measure, right? So this is a recipe, for example, to do what you were doing, which is to compute that, uh, that integral, right? So, so the constants depend on L, and uh, you know, essentially the proof goes by proving it for L equals one, and then you do, do it by induction. So what is this banner space? So it's a banner space where you have a control uh, function, a kind of a scale function. So you can think of it as a polynomial in a Q and P, or even just in P, in some simple case. Uh, so, so the idea is that you, uh, are only looking at observable that are negligible or about the same magnitude as that uh, scaling function. So they are bounded uh, <coughs> by this uh, KL. And the intuition, the physical intuition is that KL is some kind of uh, energy. But uh, we'll, we'll write an explicit formula for them. So um, it's not completely obvious uh, how much information you have in this kind of convergent statement. So this is telling you this is going quickly to zero. You're not in complete control of what the constants are, so you don't know how quickly. Even though there's lots of constants flying in the assumptions, there's not a map from the constants to those constants. Uh, but maybe we can extract it. Uh, I don't know. That's the question. Uh, but you know, even uh, forgetting about this, so this is kind of the, the error you're making at the beginning, if you wish. So this is P0 of i. And uh, this, this saying that this quantity goes exponentially uh, to zero in time is not, uh, is, it's not entirely clear what it says, right? Because it's a weighted uh, L infinity. So some of the things that, uh, some of the information uh, in the s portions of the space where KL is actually large, so high energy uh, places, are actually kind of discounted heavily by this formula. 
So it's not completely clear for me. It's a, you know, it's a theorem. Uh, so surely this is interesting. And concretely, we use it uh, by saying that we have good uh, static, uh, uh, good ways to compute the static information. But uh, I, I don't visualize very clearly uh, what's the price to pay for having a, for in, in the, um, in using this uh, weight. Okay, so let's show the weight. So the family of weights. So it, so it, it depends on whether you're working with a position space which is bounded, or a torus, some kind of uh, periodic uh, box, or if you're working with the full of the reals. So if you're working within a box, then you don't even need to depend on position. You have just some kind of control of the kinetic energy uh, raised to the power of uh, L. And uh, if you are in the full case, where no boundary and, uh, and no bounded mass, you have, uh, so you s if you read this expression, you see that there is a, a weight, or A, which is some kind of constant that you have to extract, positive. This is the total energy we had before in the classical case. And then you have an additional uh, two cross terms that you have to use to control the generalized total energy if you want. So this is, uh, this, this looks like the classical term and you have this, these two additional objects that uh, form some kind of, you know, generalized notion of total energy, I guess. And you know that uh, this, this KL, uh, whatever L is, is uh, integrable with respect to your invariant measure. And like I said, this, uh, this is a careful, we follow the proof path, or Matthias and Ben follow the proof path of this uh, former uh, paper on the non-position dependent case. So, so now we have our theorem, so we can play with the model. So now we can do some kind of programming, so to speak, by choosing carefully a little, uh, uh, you know, position dependent terms. So, uh, how, did you know how long I, I have? You started at 10 after the time. Right? So another, sure. another 10 minutes, maybe? Uh, yeah. yeah. Or, yeah. yeah, about 10, okay. So let's do the nice thing first. So we're going to, so everything is completely ordinary, and uh, we're going to just play with the temperatures here. So we, we have a position dependent temperature. So the friction is constant, strictly positive, and uh, we need to pick a good U. And uh, now already we have an uh, invariant measure that does not look uh, like the Boltzmann one. Is it Ito or Toto? Is it Ito. And uh, if, if we're, go if we're working on the full um, uh, position space, then we need to say something about you know, how hot it can get far away. Okay. <laughs> you're dependent on P or not. Sorry? I mean, if, if you're dependent also on P, then you're, you're dependent. Thank you. So we pick up 64 particles. They're, so you need, the, they are going to interact by, uh, uh, you know, uh, some kind of, uh, we have yet to say what the potential is. So the potential is going to try to keep them apart somewhat. So it's uh, slightly repulsive. I'll show you uh, the, the potential uh, next uh, slide. So we have uh, a two-dimensional torus. So we have 128 uh, position uh, coordinates to track. And uh, here we, so essentially we, we construct a bump in temperature, which is centered at the center of the box and uh, goes down very quickly. Uh, there's a curve and so you have to fix the parameters which are the, the minimum temperature, the max, with the delta T with the max and this thing. And there may be a typo here, maybe it's, uh, there's no minus here. All right, so, we, so uh, concretely we have this box and we heat the middle of the box and then this, uh, this uh, and then it tails off uh, quite quickly to reach some kind of constant minimum temperature. So also, if we forget about temperature, it just means that the noise kicks in stronger at the middle of the box. So what do we expect as a stationary measure? Maybe, so the, the particles are going to repel each other. So they're going to self-organize in space in a way that they are not too close to one another. But we expect somehow that uh, there will be fewer, the density 
I don't know, what do you expect? What would you expect? Is that something I can... Uh, whiteboard. So we have this box, which is periodical. Here we have some kind of regularly symmetric uh, source of heat. And here we have some kind of uh, profile of temperature, which is like this. So T max. And this is T min. And we throw our little particles. And they diffuse with uh, just thing a different noise when they're outside this uh, central disk. So we have to say how they repel each other first. So we, they, we repel them with a semi-spring, if, if I may say something like this. So that it's like a spring, but uh, when, when you've passed the resting point, there's no, it's neutral. So they're kind of, um, so technically it's interesting because it's not actually smooth. There's a discontinuity for the second order derivative, but uh, uh, Ben has, uh, so you know, sometimes in the secrets of numerical integration, you know that smoothness assumptions actually don't play a real role in the integration. So. Right, but nevertheless, uh, it integrates well. So here's what we get. So this is the radial density away from the heat source. So maybe I, I look at this one first, which is uh, more. So this is for two different, this is the uh, position density. Oh, so we're not talking about the velocities here. For two different uh, value of the friction. So for high friction, we see that we have completely deserted the, the middle uh, ground which is too hot, which is not maybe, not, I mean, you know, I don't know. And we have this wave which, are, uh, which we see in this, uh, when we draw, we draw a radius, which we see here when we go away from the center. We have a wavy structure when we go away from the center, from the heat source. And that is uh, uh, the consequence of the repelling uh, potential. So the particles don't want to be at the same place. So somehow that scale should be related to the the parameters of the repulsion, the, this, uh, which was called something before, <laughs> right? So it's interesting. So the the uh, uh, so just by looking at this, which I should have put first, we see that um, I mean, if we believe the numerical integration as as we do, we we see that uh, for low friction, actually the temperature gradient is kind of uh, un not seen by the particles. And it's only when it's when they start to getting really slow that they feel the the temperature changes, and that's what we see here. So here, these are each color codes for a increasing frictions, and the, the ultimately the black curve here is actually the temperature gradient, is the bump uh, drawn regularly. So we see when that the friction is um, sufficiently strong the uh, density completely follows the, the, temp the, sorry, the effective temperature, which, which is just the, what you think, the long-term average of the uh, uh, square of the momenta, uh, is actually following exactly the prescription of the heat source. Right, so, there's, so, so what can we say? So it's not a standard Boltzmann. And there's an interesting interplay between the uh, constant friction and the, the shape of the temperature gradient. In, in that limit, you can derive the linear equation for the position based on high friction. Right. Right. That one may be Some kind of Brownian uh, version of the. Right. It would not eliminate the momenta. It would be different from the temperature. So it would be interesting. Gamma, gamma going to infinity. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, uh, I've heard Matthias and Ben. You can't get the load. That's average. It's a total distance. It's decreasing energy. Because you have a product on the training, right? No, no, that's the average. Oh, I thought you were saying move ahead. And move on. See, stop. You're the chair, right? Okay. So, okay, so, so no, that's interesting. Well, it would be good to do it because that would be another way to, to test the, the, the predictions. 
Okay. So we've seen this. So now let's do a non-conservative force, right? This is the, the second term we're going to play with. The, so we take a uh, completely standard thing. We, we take a um, potential which is going to place one particle in, uh, in any of four wells of potential. This is what you, oh. this is what your four is for. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have this anti-symmetric uh, matrix, which, uh, so which, which makes the entire system non-conservative, which is kind of uh, moving the particles uh, clockwise in this case, I think. So uh, yeah, it's stirring force, which pus pushes the system uh, clockwise around the origin. So this is for, uh, and I'm sorry, I forgot to say there is an alpha here, which allows us to weight the effect of the non-conservative part, conservative part to, uh, with respect to the normal uh, potential. So if we do nothing but the conservative part, we get this uh, thing as expected. So we get uh, the invariant distribution in space is going to project to uh, one of these four positions. Uh, this is a, a planar system. And uh, if we start plugging in the, the stirring force, then we get this uh, rotation of the uh, stationary measure, and it smears out slightly the thing. So it's, we, we both turn clockwise somewhat and then smear out the distribution. The wells are not as deep, if you, as you can see. And here you have an estimate of the momenta, or the, the stationary momenta. So you see also that the particles are moving uh, for a long time uh, along this kind of uh, clock. So this, these are interesting uh, behaviors. There was recently a Nature paper by a physicist and biologist about uh, a huge quasi-invisible uh, convection uh, motions in uh, populations of bacteria, which is partly based on uh, position-dependent uh, Langevin. But with a desert, there are all, all, I mean, the, the model is a bit more complex than this. So here we have a kind of a toy version of this uh, with this spiral. So friction. So I, I'm not going to talk about friction. I just so there's a. Uh, I was not going to talk about it anyway. So this is uh, there's a very elaborate treatment of some kind of stochastic Cooker's male modification in the paper, which I'm not going to get into. I'll just give you a little idea of what kind of behavior you can express if you start touching the friction uh, thing. So let's say we have a bunch of particles, but they are typed. So maybe they, we have blue and red particles, like in Jonathan Stoke, right? And uh, so we, depending on the type, we have uh, maybe a little uh, a, a, a friction tensor which looks at the type of the particles. So let's say the, the diagonal term, so blue versus blue, gives you a stronger friction than blue versus red. So intuitively, it tells you that uh, you're going to slow down if you have someone of the same color and you're going to not slow down that much if you have someone of the other color. So it's a kind of a sorting mechanism if you think of it. So it's only friction-based, uh, uh, position-dependent friction-based uh, uh, sorting. And here you just sum up, because you can, because you're position-dependent, you can, you can just sum up over some kind of uh, ball of a given radius to look at the, the particles that actually influence your friction. So um, so uh, we, we didn't actually uh, run that simulation. There, there's still in the drawer. But uh, I would think this is a good time model of uh, what uh, biologists call phase separation in tissues. So tissue, tissue grows and, and cells migrate. And uh, we know the transcription. We know actually in the lab, I, mean, I don't know, but people know how to transcriptionally activate those migration processes. And you see. In this little plate, you see the cells very slowly you know, over hours uh, collecting into clumps of red versus clumps of blue, which could be another solution to the redistricting of uh, North Carolina. <laughs> you could even, to, to get back to Jose's uh, first talk, you could even uh, make particle change type on the fly, depending on position. Uh, in, you know, if you're surrounded by too many people of the other color, maybe you can uh, mix in consensus dynamics. So this is not super serious. This is just to give you an idea, a computer scientist idea of looking at those uh, position-dependent Langevin dynamics as programs rather than equations. You know, what, can, what kind of behavior, and it's, it looks very rich. So I'm going to conclude with a bunch of questions, I think. 
So biological tissue example would be an interesting uh, playground. There's lots of questions, lots of experiments. We are talking about biological data earlier. So it's, uh, uh, another question is obvious here in the uh, palace of data science is can we infer friction and noise from actual trajectories, for example? Can we, can we develop these kind of techniques? Specifically, can we use, uh, so Heinz, who is going to be a speaker at this afternoon session, has a series of work on uh, inferring by using inverse reinforcement learning techniques for indistinguishable particles, uh, some kind of version of Kukus uh, smell, right? Uh, no, v or something, uh, so some, some plucking model. So this is called the uh, swarm systems, but I think swarm just means they're indistinguishable, right? And because they're indistinguishable, the uh, potentially super costly inverse reinforcement learning techniques can be somehow made cheaper. So that would be one tr thing to try to do. Then there is uh, how to relate all those, con those constants that we have uh, in the output of the proof to the constants we have in the input. So that's kind of a ground pedestrian mathematical work, which would be interesting. And then also you notice that everything is much simpler because there are no boundaries in our systems. So I, you know, uh, I just want to say we make things a lot simpler and it's probably very thorny if you start having, uh, you know, non-periodical or unbounded domains. And this is it. Thank you for your attention.